Uh, morning, yeah. Uh, you you got an invite from Kosei, yeah?
Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Jeremy. I'm the covering analyst for K Power Berhad, and uh, I'd like to invite them and and uh, all of the partic participants uh, to join in this uh, presentation. It's a joint event with M Investment Bank with, with Busa Malaysia, and um, yeah, uh, I'd like to pass the floor to K Power. The title of this presentation would be "The Future of Renewable Energy." Uh, particularly focused on hydro and solar power. Thank you. Hi everyone, can you, uh, there's some technical issues, uh, please give us a minute. Mm -hmm.
Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's Jeremy here again. I'm so sorry for initial technical issues. I'd like to introduce the speakers. Uh, firstly, is uh, Muhammad Afif. He's the uh, CFO of K-Power Berhad. And on the left side would be Shukri, which is the uh, head of corporate finance and investor relations. Um, this is a joint event with uh, M Investment Bank Berhad and Busan Malaysia. And I'll, I'll hand over the floor to, uh, to K-Power. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, hi. Uh, okay, hi guys. Uh, I'm Shukri. Uh, I'll be uh, leading this uh, presentation. Uh, so it's a combination of uh, between uh, myself uh, and then uh, Mustaqim, our group MD, uh, also CEO, and also our uh, group CFO, uh, Cik Amiro. So, sorry we are all over the place. Um, Cik Amiro is in Dubai. Our technical team is uh, outside of Malaysia as well. We are looking in uh, several jobs. Um, uh, given the short short period that we have, uh, we are going to uh, maybe uh, breeze through several of the presentation, but we will take in, uh, uh, we'll give in as much as possible. Uh, within the limited time. <clears throat> so, okay. Um, okay, so we'll start our uh, presentation uh, by the sharing. So, I will lead the introduction uh, and then uh, Amiro will take over in terms of uh, financing and also the incentives. And Mustakim will, uh, will finish it off via uh, the, um, uh, the energy outlook uh, the, what's stored in Asia uh, and also uh, about K power itself. Okay, uh, all right, so um, okay, so um, we will start uh, with the presentation. Now. Okay, so um, uh, we are assuming most of you are aware of what's energy and then, uh, renewable energy. So we are going to uh, uh, breeze through this part. Uh, basically, uh, we, what we're showing is that uh, renewable and non-renewable energy are two distinct areas. Uh, the fossil fuel, uh, gas, and everything on the non-renewable side, renewable are uh, all those uh, hydropower, biomass, and everything. Uh, sources of energy, basically, they are primary and secondary. Uh, primary uh, uh, direct from the source, and secondary uh, those that after uh, uh, processes and everything. Uh, so, okay. So the the nature of uh, sustainable uh, and uh, exhaustible uh, are the key. Uh, concern uh, for the renewable and non-renewable energy. Um, so the, the non-renewable energy, the, the key area is where it is uh, transferable and also it is uh, 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 easily packaged and, and uh, transmitted. Okay, so how energy works? Basically, um, we have the generation, uh, we have uh, transmission, and substation for when we classify renewable and non-renewable, uh, basically it's the generation portion of the uh, renewable energy side. That's where the sustainable parts comes in. The transmission and distribution, uh, there are other technology inside that, uh, that that's uh, uh, in the uh, renewable side. Uh, but for us today, we focus on the generation portion. Alright, so uh, lots uh, so we had, we'll, dis we'll discuss about uh, the various uh, mode of renewable uh, energy. Um, so renewable, basically, uh, as mentioned, uh, we use the forces of nature, uh, so that is uh, sustainable and can be uh, inexhaustive. So uh, the biggest one is wind. Uh, for our focus today, we will focus on ASEAN nation, uh, Saudi Asia. So for Saudi Asia, uh, Basically, wind is only in Vietnam, 
Okay, for renewable energy, there are basically two parts. One is the rotating part, uh, where you spin the turbine, um, which is like uh, even on the normal uh, generation for fossil fuel, where uh, energy is created to, uh, to spin the turbine, and then uh, electricity was created. So another part is via uh, heat, uh, which is uh, via solar and everything. So wind is uh, using kinetic energy, then to, to, to spin the turbine by uh, wind. Uh, installed capacity, of course, uh, this has uh, been uh, growing from 7.5 gigawatt in 1997 to 564 gigawatt, mostly in Europe. Uh, but then again, we've seen uh, a lot of the huge Omega turbine. Uh, wind turbine has been um, demolished or has been brought down because of various other factors in Europe. Uh, in, in South Asia, there's a, in, uh, <coughs> what call that, uh, in Vietnam, as mentioned just now. Okay, biomass. Uh, biomass is basically bioenergy. Uh, can be anything from waste uh, uh, to wood chip to uh, papers or all, uh, even human waste. Eh? So, three quarter of the world, uh, Renewable energy uh, involve some form of bioenergy. Hola. Hey, hey, bro, can 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 I talk to you later? I am in the briefing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, and then uh, so again, uh, the leader in uh, biomass is in Brazil. There's a lot of uh, growth uh, in. Historically, the world countries have a lot of this biomass, and only the uh, the developed country has using this to make it more efficient. So we have lots of this in uh, South Asia as well. Thermal, okay, geothermal is where we use the uh, heat from the uh, uh, volcano and all those. Uh, the, this is this fits where uh, Iceland, El Salvador, uh, New Zealand, and Kenya uh, for the uh, this type of uh, uh, installment. Eh? Uh, okay, so uh, we have one in Malaysia in Katawa. Mm. Uh, we have one in Malaysia uh, that use the geothermal uh, Tawau where they tap into the uh, heat source. Uh, in the ground, yeah. Uh, so that's the only one uh, in Malaysia. There are a few others, uh, especially uh, there's a lot of potential in Indonesia uh, since they have a lot of volcano and high uh, high compressed gas inside uh, uh, the area. So this also is another uh, area that that, that can be uh, looked at. <coughs> so again, eh, uh, this is where the dry steam, uh, flash steam, binary cycle, all these are uh, basically they just step for the internal combustion uh, pressure uh, inside uh, the ground. Then uh, again, it goes back to kinetic energy where you will speed the turbine. All right, solar. Okay, solar is where we will uh, explore further later on. So we today we focus more on hydro and solar. So solar is where it's not kinetic energy so much, but more inside uh, via uh, either heat or uh, direct light. Eh? So they switch it over. Um, uh, so there are two basic uh, uh, installation. One are individual system for homes and small communities. So this is where uh, now all the big news about uh, net energy metering and everything so this is where the individual systems come in, and then photovoltaic or concentrated. So this is uh, utility scale. Uh, utility scale. Um, uh, utility scale uh, installation. Uh, where uh, our most recent one is the LSS4. Uh, we are waiting for that to be announced. So hopefully soon. So uh, we'll talk about uh, this a bit more later on. And then, of course, hydro, the, um, which is where we our most of our business is in. So hydro is basically uh, utilizing again kinetic energy. This is uh, kinetic energy to spin the turbine. So there are lots of methods, as mentioned just now. Wind, it can be uh, geothermal or biomass or any method. So hydro is the uh, uh, so-called coolest uh, or not doesn't involve so much heat. 
because we use the uh, water uh, uh, to spin uh, the turbine eh? and then that turbine will generate electricity and be transported uh, to the grid. So this is where the general hydro areas. Eh? So okay, uh, when it comes to hydro, basically it's just uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, parts involved in hydro but uh, the two key part is uh, heat and flow. Heat and flow is basically heat is the change in water level from uh, the highest point uh, of the water all the way to the uh, when the water reach the turbine. So the higher it is uh, then the more the gravity will work and then the faster the turbine can be uh, spin. So that will increase your generation capacity and, and others. So flow refers to the flow of the water uh, throughout the period. So uh, meaning uh, throughout the year, they are taking into account uh, high seasonal uh, changes eh? in uh, high rainfall season, low rainfall season. Uh, the flow will determine the minimum amount that we can uh, produce. So the, of course, this study is being carried uh, taken over over how many years, uh, 20 years sometimes even, uh, for the uh, hydro. And then uh, there are typically three types, uh, one large power hydro, small mini, small hydro and micro hydro. So this, the definition depends depending on where you are, but generally uh, worldwide, this is the, the, the the, uh, the definition. So large usually those with more than 30 megawatt, uh, small between 30 megawatt to 100 kilowatt. So uh, there are places where uh, less than 25 only they will consider as small. They are 35, but roughly about 30 megawatt plus minus 10. So micro hydropower, micro hydropower was uh, those are really small that that that, that uh, for self uh, self use and all that, which is 100 kilowatt and everything. All right, so there are three types. Uh, one are impoundment, uh, one diversion or run of river, and one is pump storage. So this will uh, be more uh, uh, relevant uh, at later stages when we talk about uh, the potential. So the impoundment is basically uh, typical. Uh, the one that you see all the time is where uh, uh, there's a huge um, uh, dam where they hold the water and then it will be transmitted downwards to the turbine. Run of river, so run of river is where most of the uh, mini hydro comes in. Uh, there are some diversion of water from the uh, river uh, to a pen stop outside and then it will be uh, turn the turbine. So pump up storage is where uh, they pump up the water to a higher point. So again, uh, this is where the heat and flow comes in. Eh? So the heat valuation is the difference between the highest point and the lowest point. So they will pump up the water at the higher point uh, at, during the low period and then they will release it uh, when there's a demand. So this is more of a picking plan, picking plan when there's a need uh, for uh, additional electricity. Eh? So and then power plant itself, there are three types. Uh, there's low heat, there's medium heat and high heat. So uh, most in Malaysia is basically we are in medium heat, medium heat and high heat is for the big ones like Bakun and then we have to Munggu and Kenyi. So those are the high heats. Uh, but for all uh, mini hydros in Malaysia, all are medium heat. So the main difference is basically only uh, in terms of the heat. Uh, the high heat means from the highest point to the lowest point, uh, the lowest point being the turbine uh, being pin uh, when we flow it to the turbine. The high heat is 100, 100 meters to 2,000 meters. So this is the huge turbine, so the impoundment type. The medium heat where we operate mostly is uh, from 30 meter to 100 meter. So this not necessarily means there's a dam or pen stop. Uh, it can be diverted from the top of the river to the bottom part of the river. So that's 30 megawatt. Uh, the low heat uh, purely uh, uh, run of river, uh, so that's less than um, uh, 30 meters, sometimes it's even 5 uh, meters or so. So, uh, so once we, now a lot of 
projects are exploring on the low heat as well. So in stock capacity, hydro, uh, in Malaysia, we have about uh, gigawatt and worldwide, uh, there are more than 1,000 uh, gigawatt of uh, hydro available. Eh? Alright, <coughs> so uh, we go to the potential for hydro and solar. Uh, okay, there are a lot of um, resources out there, uh, but um, I think you can Google that one, but we, uh, there are some permission issue, uh, but we share this one with you. Uh, this is from the World Bank Group. So uh, when it comes to solar, uh, so which is our, we will discuss solar and hydro uh, mostly for this time. Eh? So when it comes to solar, this is uh, according to uh, World Bank Group uh, potential. So potential is, you see all those red, dark red ones, are the best areas, uh, the yellow, uh, quite good. Uh, the lower ones are not that great. So you can see the upper region uh, of Malaysia have uh, that's quite good. Laos, Cambodia, and all that is pretty. Uh, this uh, one of the best. Uh, so there are two types of measurement. One is a direct normal radiation. So direct normal radiation, which is a direct uh, sunlight. Oh. So direct sunlight uh, to the uh, to the uh, place. So if you look at that, then Malaysia is not that great. Uh, we are we fall under less than uh, three kilowatt uh, per meter square. But uh, and then uh, the south east northern part of uh, South Asia is quite good. Eh? But if you look at the global horizontal radiation, uh, so this is where. Uh, uh, there's another method uh, of uh, generating electricity to solar. Uh, this is where Malaysia and all the other South Asia country uh, suddenly become huge potential. So you see all the red, dark red areas are in the South Asian country. Okay, uh, we just focus on, uh, since we don't have time, if we just pick and choose uh, several country. Eh? We just, so this place uh, for solar, we focus on Malaysia. So you can see uh, Malaysia, so the potential is huge uh, in all the northern state uh, on the uh, beach side, eh, east coast and uh, west coast, but really, really good in Sabah and uh, northern side of Sarawak. The east Malaysia is quite good. Uh, northern state of Kedah, Penang, uh, Pahang, uh, it's really good. So when you, as you go downwards towards Johor Bahru, uh, the uh, the average out PV uh, out per meter square, meaning per area, uh, how many kilowatt hour can be produced, uh, is a lot less. Eh? So uh, when it comes to solar installment uh, installation in Malaysia, is mostly is northern states uh, and East Malaysia. Uh, for most efficient uh, and also for it to be economically viable. Okay, when it comes to hydro, all right, so what we share with you here is uh, the terrain for uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN, eh, South Asia. So when it comes to hydro, like you mentioned just now, uh, it all involves about uh, heat and flow. So the good thing about ASEAN, we have heavy rainfall, so there's uh, lots of water, there's river everywhere. Uh, and we are a mountainous region, mountainous, lots of hills, there's a uh, peak and valley. Eh? So if you look at the red areas, uh, the green ones are the flat, uh, mostly flat. So if you look at Malaysia, uh, Laos, Thailand, uh, so we have lots of these uh, ranges eh, that uh, we provide this high head uh, uh, and support this, uh, the support this uh, uh, hydropower uh, requirement, eh? so more efficient. So if we focus specifically on the uh, northern side of South Asia, which is Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, so you can see there's lots of rivers, and do all these rivers flows from the uh, uh, range eh? uh, uh, that flow all the way from uh, Nepal goes to uh, Mekong. So huge uh, area, huge capacity for hydro in the northern side. In Indonesia as well, very uh, huge potential. 
Okay, so um, the bigger part for uh, for uh, the uh, ASEAN, uh, so we have this uh, ASEAN power grid, uh, not a lot of people are aware of it, but uh, I think we have to mention that uh, we have this ASEAN power grid that has been uh, on construction since uh, the early 2000s. So when we were, uh, well, when Mustaqim, uh, Amiru and myself uh, were in the we were in the investment bank and the rating houses. So uh, this has been uh, ongoing. Uh, so this means, it means that uh, there's a transmission line that goes from uh, here, uh, Laos, uh, all, all the way to Singapore. So any energy that's been uh, produced here will be transmitted to Thailand be exported to Thailand, Malaysia, or even Singapore, especially Singapore, where there's a renewable energy potential is quite low. So we'll talk about it uh, in a short while, huh, in terms of uh, ASEAN target and everything. So this is uh, what we have uh, in 2016. Uh, as of uh, 2020, this is the latest one. Uh, this is the line, the interconnection that's been dedicated to this. Uh, so that's 2000 uh, plus over megawatt. Um, and if you see in Laos, um, so if you see, so this is uh, Laos. Uh, Laos is where uh, Okay, Laos is where uh, we call the battery of uh, South Asia. So whatever that's being produced in Laos uh, is being exported uh, to uh, South Asia, uh, to Thailand, uh, even all the way to Malaysia. So in Malaysia, uh, back in early, uh, early 2000, there's this uh, power, uh, power plant called TTPC, the Technology, uh, Tenaga Technology Perlis. So that one also, we export it to Thailand. Apparently Thailand is a huge uh, consumer of <laughs> electricity. So this ASEAN power grid uh, enables uh, the, uh, the energy being uh, con uh, produced anywhere in ASEAN uh, to be transmitted, especially in the greater uh, area where Laos, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, and Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and also Singapore. So there are also, uh, potential uh, or plan uh, from Malaysia uh, to export to Brunei Darussalam, uh, even uh, Kalimantan or even Philippines. Uh, in South Asia, uh, in Indonesia, um, where uh, Malaysia will export uh, to Indonesia and, and vice versa. Um, okay, so this is historical uh, energy supply by fuel. Uh, from 20, 2005 to 2017, um, typically uh, coal has uh, among the uh, bigger uh, contributor. Uh, natural gas is, uh, and then oil. Oil by oil means diesel and all those. And renewable energy combustion has been very small. Um, but uh, as you're aware, uh, recently, uh, not recently, there's a few, few years back, there's a pact to reduce the uh, carbon emission from all this electric density. Uh, so coal is one of the biggest contributor for carbon uh, uh, emission uh, in the world. So um, as of now, as of last year even, uh, coal project uh, will, uh, will be very difficult to be financed and even insured uh, as a result of this uh, uh, movement. So locally, even uh, CIMB uh, last year has been received a huge flag for financing uh, coal, uh, new coal power project. So uh, for thus uh, the challenges for to produce uh, electricity in the future. Okay, so this is the forecast. Uh, this uh, we got this from the, the latest one in December last year. Uh, ASEAN uh, Energy Minister, there's a, a meeting uh, where they have a set a target for 35% uh, installed capacity for renewable energy and also 23 or 22% uh, uh, 
23% uh, com, uh, of uh, renewable energy share in the uh, supply. Um, so uh, from there, uh, they have from the target, then you can see um, this uh, baseline is if they use as per normal. Eh? So it's being separated into year 2025 and also uh, 2040. So these are the forecasts. Eh? So basic is 2017. So you can see the uh, contribution from coal will go lower over time. Uh, and then the contribution from uh, renewable energy uh, will increase. So this is the renewable energy segment is where we will uh, be you know, focusing this on later on. Eh? Okay, so uh, uh, we'll explain more on the uh, uh, potential uh, that we must keep with the other part. So for now, uh, we'll uh, pass it over to uh, Amirul for the financing of this. Uh, thank you, Shok. Uh, can you guys clear me clearly? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Okay, uh, let me start on the financing part. Um, any project finance, uh, any project which with this size of uh, capital required um, would be need financing. And typically there are uh, two types of financing uh, for this kind of project. Uh, if you look at the slide, um, number one is uh, corporate financing uh, compared to project financing. What's the difference? Yeah? Um, if you are a contractor uh, getting a project from uh, someone who got uh, the project awarded to you, uh, then you call yourself a contractor. Then you require corporate financing. And if you are a project owner, meaning uh, you got the project from, say, TMB, uh, that is called, uh, then you look for financing, that is called project financing. Yeah? Okay. Um, typically, the difference are uh, the financing vehicle for corporate will be the corporate itself. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, this corporate has other businesses as well. And um, obviously, it has other sources of revenue coming in uh, compared to a project owner. Usually, they would finance it under special purpose vehicle. We call it SPV uh, with single revenue source from this project alone. Okay. Um, other type of uh, differences or features uh, involve things like dividend payout, um, where uh, corporate financing uh, is more flexible. Uh, project financing would have to be structured um, and there could be some uh, requirements like uh, the SRA, that's a big reserve account, uh, the SCR, that service uh, reserve ratio uh, to be met before you could pay dividend. Um, capital uh, investment decision, in terms of capital investment decision, uh, there's uh, not too much clarity uh, to creditors uh, because it changes every year. Um, as for project finance, um, because it's single purpose, uh, you would know it up front from very beginning. Yeah. Uh, as for financial structure, uh, typically very straightforward uh, financing required. Um, as for project financing, uh, you need to tailor make the structure uh, to the project's specific needs, meaning uh, there's a single source of cash flow, so you structure the repayment based on the cash flow that you would receive over the project period. In terms of transaction costs, uh, corporate financing is usually lower uh, compared to project financing because it's more complicated uh, and you will require more due diligence uh, such as uh, technical, uh, legal as well as uh, auditor that you need to hire, not to mention uh, tax agent as well. Uh, size of financing, uh, corporate financing can be very flexible. You can borrow as small as, say, for example, 1 million uh, to as large as a few hundred million. Uh, project financing uh, usually is a big uh, financing amount you're talking about here. Okay. Uh, as for basis for credit evaluation, um, for corporate financing, uh, it will be relied not on just uh, the contract that um, uh, the company receives. It's also on other projects uh, that it has. Uh, as for project uh, financing, you'll be relying uh, solely on the 
um, mostly solely on the uh, the strength of the SPV as well as its sponsors. Yeah. Uh, next slide, Shuk. Okay. Uh, this is a typical uh, contract financing. Uh, assuming, yeah, uh, in this is K Power is the SPC contractor. Uh, for a contract uh, value of hundred million, for example, um, uh, typically thirty percent of that uh, is required as uh, we call it working cap, uh, working capital. Yeah? Uh, uh, normal um, security required under this scenario uh, would be. Uh, assignment of project proceeds, uh, meaning that the payment from the project owner uh, will be assigned to the bank. So this is pretty straightforward. 100 million, uh, 100 million contract size. You borrow uh, 30 million uh, to perform the project over a period of, for example, two to three years period. Okay, uh, next one, Shuk. Okay, as for project finance, uh, you have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you have uh, financing parties, uh, usually equity investors uh, of the project. Uh, we call it sponsors, uh, the banks uh, as uh, the lender uh, and debt capital market players. These are the sukuks that we issue uh, typically for uh, large scale uh, project finance. And you have a special vehicle. Uh, like I mentioned, a special focus vehicle only uh, for this project, meaning your uh, revenue source is single source from the project alone. Uh, okay. um, and the debt is raised uh, either on uh, limited recourse, uh, no recourse at all, um, as credit enhancement uh, for the uh, credit of the project. <coughs> Next one. Okay. Uh, a generic project finance structure will look like this. Uh, you replace that government. Um, uh, usually, if you, I give you an example of uh, in Malaysian scenario, uh, this will be a government agency such as uh, uh, Sujan Jaya Tenaga uh, or uh, SEDA. Yeah? Uh, you have um, sponsors. Uh, these sponsors are the uh, project owner. Uh, they are the ones uh, being awarded uh, the project under the SPV. Yeah, okay. And the uh, off-take agreement uh, in this case uh, can mean uh, TMB uh, in Malaysia context. And you have other other parties as well. Uh, on the right side, you see there's a lender um, debt financing. Uh, they do they lend money to SPV to undertake the project. A uh, unit insurance policies uh, to be covered. Uh, such as um, uh, CAR, um, if we oversee project, um, <clears throat> usually uh, in countries like uh, Laos, uh, Nepal, Indonesia, there is a poten there, there are possibility that lenders would request you to take uh, PRI, Polity Risk Insurance, uh, given the country's uh, risk. Uh, yeah. And um, there's also O&M operator. Uh, when operator is the one that does um, operation and maintenance for the project and uh, the contractor is where um, that gets uh, the contractor that gets uh, EPCC uh, contract uh, and they usually will require um, uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, contract financing next special next special yeah sure Okay. Uh, okay. This is one uh, case study that we have. Uh, this is a, a large scale solar farm under LSS2. Um, under this scenario, um, the SPV. Uh, uh, okay, Holding Co is the project owner. Uh, the SPV. Um, uh, the the project was awarded to SPV. Uh, there's concession agreement there. Uh, it's actually uh, the award. Uh, TMB, you have TMB uh, to actually uh, as of take uh, signing you signing with you of the agreement in the form of uh, renewable energy uh, power purchase agreement. We call it REPA. Yeah, uh, SPV will award the project to a contractor. Okay, uh, then you sign EPC agreement, and um, under this uh, uh, real transaction that uh, was done, um, the project uh, debt or we call it senior debt. 
uh, was uh, around 80%. And um, so the holding company or rather the sponsor would have to put 20%. Uh, tenure was uh, up to 18 years. Uh, typically, REPA will be uh, up to 21 years. Uh, so in this case, uh, they were able to actually borrow up to uh, 18 years. Uh, minimum FSCR, uh, finance service coverage ratio required is 1.25 times. Uh, and security package under this one is um, all the assets the SPV has. Uh, legal assignment of the um, uh, PPA as well as the uh, agreement. Yeah, and um, second legal charge over shares of the customer, uh, meaning the share of SPV is being, um, uh, what do you call that, uh, assigned uh, to the lenders. And uh, deed of subordination, what does it mean by deed of subordination? It means that uh, the advance or the equity that has been pumped in uh, uh, by of 20% uh, is being subordinated to the lenders. The senior debt are being paid first. The 80% debt is paid first before the equity holder can get uh, any return or repayment on their uh, advances or equity money. Okay, uh, next one, sure. Okay, uh, next one. This is a uh, incentive. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the incentives that uh, uh, that is being uh, promoted or rather uh, churned out by uh, countries uh, in the region. Uh, typically, there are uh, a few types. Uh, what does it mean by number one is uh, fit-in tariff, or, or we call it FIT. Um, you'll see that a typical power plant uh, will have certain rate uh, to encourage uh, RE uh, projects. Um, the government uh, introduced um, a favorable rate. Uh, for example, uh, under a normal solar program uh, in Malaysia, uh, you will get around 16 cents or uh, 70 cents. Um, sorry, what I mean is hydro projects. Yeah? Under normal hydro, small hydro project in Malaysia, uh, you will get around 16 cents to 17 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, but under FIT, uh, you could get up to uh, perhaps 28, 29 cents um, um, if you win uh, the bid. Uh, yeah. Okay, number two is on soft loans. Um, it could be via um, development uh, financial institutions. Uh, there's also uh, agencies uh, that the government created um, to uh, support the industry and lend uh, its balance sheet. Yeah? Uh, there's also tax incentive uh, in the form of uh, ITA, uh, investment tax allowance, um, or green um, tax incentive, uh, depending on the countries. <clears throat> okay, countries with um, uh, the alternative, uh, Indonesia is there, uh, uh, Malaysia as well. Malaysia is very active in this, and, and Thailand. Um, as for F FIT, um, you have uh, Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, tax incentive, uh, Myanmar, Singapore, Cambodia, and Laos. Uh, I think you could get in, put in um, Malaysia as well. Yeah. <clears throat> In terms of ranking, uh, at this moment, uh, Thailand is leading the way uh, with 6.2 gigawatt per hour. Okay, uh, Philippines at 3.6, uh, Indonesia 3.6, uh, Malaysia is still far behind at 1.5, uh, and Vietnam at 0 0.7. Uh, as for Malaysia, there's huge potential um, at 1.5 uh, because of the uh, government's incentive and a lot more uh, uh, <coughs> potential. Uh, in the region, in in the country. Yeah. Next stage, next page. Good. Okay. Uh, okay. This is Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia, we have a green tech uh, financing scheme, uh, where uh, there is a loan guarantee scheme with uh, two percent interest rebate and sixty percent loan guarantee. Uh, what it means here, uh, if you borrow, um, uh, say hundred million, um. The GTFS will uh, rebate, uh, will give you a rebate on your interest rate uh, or profit rate that you pay on your uh, borrowings. Yeah, uh, they also uh, guarantee sixty percent uh, of the <coughs> of the loan. Yeah. <coughs> uh, 
I think um, for GTFS number one 1.0, uh, that's finished. Um, uh, and they've come out with a, a new program. Uh, there's also another program that they've put in place. Uh, slightly different in terms of uh, characteristic uh, from one to another. Uh, next one. Okay, uh, Malaysia has also introduced um, sustainable and resiliency investment SRI framework uh, under SC Securities Commission. Uh, there's a, there's a few sukuks uh, that have been issued under uh, this uh, scheme, yeah, uh, such as uh, Talikosang Hydropower. Uh, that's one of the uh, recent one issued in 2019. Yeah. There's also Asian Green Bond Standard. Uh, where you can issue under this um, a category <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot of demand uh, for this kind of uh, so, the so-called uh, green suku uh, uh, from investor. <clears throat> in fact, Indonesia uh, in 2018 issued uh, a 1.25 billion uh, uh, suku. Uh, it's a for sovereign for green so cool. Next one. Okay, uh, this uh, chart shows you uh, the various uh, scheme uh, that is being uh, implemented or introduced uh, for renewable energy in Malaysia. So um, there's a lot of incentive for uh, a company like us to actually um, look into this area. Yeah? Um, you talk about uh, GTFS, um, EPC, uh, EACSG, MESITA. Uh, on this list alone, there's at least uh, four or five uh, categories or areas uh, that you can look at and uh, get the incentive. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, some sample um, for Thailand. Uh, there's also uh, energy conservation promotion fund. Uh, they call it ENCON. Um, <coughs> it, it's actually this fund uh, is derived uh, from um, basically uh, you get uh, so-called levy or uh, syntax of um, uh, Thai baht 0.1 uh, per liter. Uh, so they they manage to get around two hundred million uh, dollars yeah, annually, and and in two thousand seventeen had around one point one billion. So this one point one billion is used to support uh, RE. So uh, basically, the fossil fuel uh, sectors um, are being taxed uh, in a way uh, to support RE. Yeah. So that's what um, uh, Thailand has done. Okay. Uh, next one. Sure. Okay, uh, as for the scheme, um, I think there's um, a few ways there's grant uh, uh, for uh, for commercial uh, sectors, uh, there's for uh, industrial, there's uh, a loan as well, uh, there's venture capital uh, that's coming in. Um, I think uh, pretty much there's a lot of support yeah, uh, from uh, various um, uh, from from government uh, on various areas uh, for one to actually uh, undertake this project, yeah. Like um, as for uh, RE players in general, um, uh, is is uh, critical for uh, for them to actually get uh, support from lenders, yeah. Given um, the government support is one. Uh, you still need to source for your own uh, senior debt at project level, uh, even uh, for contract financing. So um, the banks uh, are pretty much uh, need to play critical role to ensure uh, the projects are funded and uh, for the sponsors to from uh, to complete the project. Um, next one, Shu. Okay, I think I'll uh, give it back to you, Shu. Or Mustaqim. Okay, uh, so uh, thanks, Miro. Uh, as Amiro mentioned, uh, mostly uh, every ASEAN, we don't have time to go through every state in ASEAN, uh, every country in ASEAN. So typically, is uh, there's some sum of fund 
uh, sinful tax or sin tax like Andrew mentioned uh, in Thailand petroleum products in Malaysia is contribution from the energy producers uh, that fund will be utilized to uh, subsidize or finance uh, all the uh, renewable energy projects so uh, we will go to the demand in initially uh, 20 years ago renewable energy project uh, has been very difficult to finance uh, but eventually uh, as the price goes down uh, the cost of producing is goes down and the support with the government uh, via the utilization of fund uh, there's some sort of fund also in indonesia and cambodia and also uh, uh, even laos so that actually promote uh, the growth on the RE, uh, renewable energy projects uh, in Malaysia, uh, in uh, some Asia countries uh, and worldwide even. So now uh, on the uh, we're looking at for the demand for renewables. Uh, so Mustakim uh, will take over uh, from this part. Eh? Uh, thank you, Shuk. Thank you, Amirul. I think. Uh, both have uh, highlighted the importance of uh, uh, basically the renewable energies, uh, the so-called how the renewable energy come into play and uh, the criteria of the renewable energy and uh, most importantly how this renewable energy can, uh, can grow in the future. And of course uh, when we talk about renewable energy uh, investment, uh, of course, uh, it relates uh, purely on the demand of renewable energy itself. Uh, and uh, here I'm going to touch a little bit on the uh, on the demand of renewable energy in Malaysia and also in Southeast Asia, and uh, what it entails uh, for this demand to grow, and uh, what will be the criteria, and uh, and what are we looking at at this point of time. And of course, um, if we look even at the valuation of renewable energy market at this point of time, it has grown. Uh, it has grown tremendously. Uh, in 2017, I think the valuation is only about 900 to 950 billion. Uh, and as of um, and it has grown tremendously, and we expect that in 2025, the valuation of RE alone is going to grow up until maybe 2 to 2.5 trillion US dollar and uh, of course uh, why this happened is basically uh, it's a combination of few factors and we are talking about uh, there is a concerted effort by all the governments to increase the renewable energy uh, output uh, in every countries and uh, by doing that you can see there is a effort put out by the government of all the countries uh, by giving incentive grants and to promote this renewable energy right from residential until the industrial i think that play a major part uh, in uh, in uh, shifting the the importance of renewable energy in the uh, energy sectors and of course uh, there is also a huge and growing confidence in the investors especially in the uh, in the private equity, in the financial uh, finance, uh, financial institutions to support the investment uh, in the renewable energy. And uh, I think uh, the third part is basically uh, the ability of uh, renewable energy itself to reduce the, the, the cost to the energy itself. We need to say that uh, if you look at the solar uh, the tariff solar based on the bidding exercise, not only in Malaysia but uh, globally, has reduced tremendously, and uh, it can now go lower than actually the tariff of the bio uh, of the gas-fired power plant. So basically, the ability of the uh, renewable energy to to further reduce in terms of tariff has make it more attractive and uh, given a lot of uh, incentive by government itself it uh, actually escalate the demand of investment in renewable energy so if you will look at the energy outlook okay uh, we can see that uh, by 2050 there is an expectation of uh, increase of 50 percent of the demand in terms of energy uh, of course this is uh, uh, basically uh, directly on the increase in the 
uh, economic uh, scenario uh, in terms of populations and things like that. And of course, uh, from there, there is also, uh, there should be an increase in renewable energy. Uh, and we expect that global demand growth to go uh, more than 4%. And uh, if you look into the energy investment, uh, global renewable energy investment from 2010 to 2019 has, uh, I think, the total investment uh, is about 2.8 trillion. Okay, and of course, um, in the renewable energy itself, uh, it's already about 300 billion. Okay, and um, if we are talking about Malaysia and Asian energy mix target by 2025. Uh, all the governments um, have put the target to increase the renewable energy installation uh, by 35% and they have actually achieved around 20% in 2019. Okay, and um, of course uh, we see that there is uh, two major uh, renewable energy sector that is going to come into play uh, significantly. Number one is the hydropower uh, and uh, and also the solar. Okay, next. All right. Um, this slide we are going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on the opportunities in the energy sector. Of course, when we talk about Asian countries, uh, there is, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of effort has been put by all the countries to meet the escalating energy demand uh, based on their growing population and the economic activities. And of course, uh, we see that there will be a huge investment in the energy infrastructure, for example, like uh, transmissions. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, investment or a lot of facilities that are going to be put uh, in the, a lot of remote areas within the country itself. Uh, which has not, which we believe that there is an opportunity that has yet to be uh, to be tapped, and uh, of course, uh, like I said earlier, uh, there is a concerted effort by all the countries within the Southeast Asia to meet the target of 35% renewable energy installation by 2025, and as of today, uh, there is a huge gap between the. We are now in 2021. There is another four years to go. Uh, there is a huge gap between what's been targeted and what's been installed at this point of time. So we believe that there is a huge opportunity in the energy sector, especially in the renewable energy uh, energy area. Okay, next. And uh, here, um, like I will, like I mentioned just now, when we talk about a huge gap, you can see um, in every countries uh, there is. Um, uh, potential uh, megawatt to be installed and what has actually been installed at this point of time. Let's say we talk about Laos, uh, there is a um, potential about 11,630 megawatt to be installed by 2025. And until today, the uh, what has been installed is only about 5,100 megawatt. So there is a huge opportunity over there. I think uh, one of the reasons why we went to Laos and we uh, we start a project in Laos basically just to tap into the huge potential over there. And uh, we believe uh, they will, uh, Laos as like what uh, Shukri mentioned just now is a bit of uh, East Asia. Uh, there is a, a lot uh, of renewable energy activities that can be explored over there. And um, the other uh, place basically is in Nepal. Uh, that is where K Power is also having a base there. There is a potential about 85,800 megawatt. Okay, and the install capacity at this point of time is only about 856 megawatt. So there is a, also a huge potential over there. And um, of course, we are talking about Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. Uh, Vietnam, uh, there is a lot of activities uh, in terms of renewable energy program and investment that have been taking place. And uh, I believe this is uh, due to the uh, government's uh, policy uh, 
uh, shifting policy from the fossil fuel to renewable energy and also government incentive uh, that be given to the uh, to the uh, investors and uh, even then we can see that uh, in like for example in Indonesia they have a huge resources we we'll talk about solar we we'll talk about uh, biomass we we'll talk about uh, mini hydros and hydro projects but yet and we have seen there's a influx of uh, investors going to Indonesia to invest in the uh, in the renewable energy program over there but yet the installed capacity for renewable energy only around 9,484 whilst the potential is about 44,000 45,200 megawatt which they are targeted to install by 2030 so this is a snapshot of uh, what's been targeted by each individual countries when we talk about their target of achieving 35% in a concerted effort of renewable energy program in the Southeast Asia. And yet we can see there's a long way uh, for them to do this. And um, by, by saying that, there is a huge opportunity for players like K-Power to look into the opportunities in each of these countries and be a major player in uh, in the renewable energy programs. Next. And um, this is why uh, this is the policy and uh, target summary by each and individual uh, country. Uh, they have their own program uh, like Malaysia. Uh, we have uh, we have actually we have a national renewable energy policy policy and we have set a specific action plan uh in 2011 and what we want to achieve in 2020 and now up to 2025 i believe uh and we have seen uh it has been applied uh, by other countries as well they have their own policy they have their own target and uh, by having this what we can see is that when all these countries has put a firm policy and action plan that means that they are very serious in tackling the uh, this uh, renewable energy uh, programs and they are very serious uh, in make sure that whatever their target is been achieved by 2025. So we see that there will be a lot more incentive, a lot more directive, a lot more firm action plan by all these uh, countries uh, in Southeast Asia. Thanks. Uh, of course, um, uh, in Malaysia, we are privileged because uh, I think Malaysia is one of the first country uh, within the Southeast Asia that have uh, uh, put up a proper uh, Renewable Energy Act uh, and also uh, Malaysia is uh, one of the country that uh, quickly uh, quickly put the development of renewable energy under uh, Sustainable Energy Development Authority Act 2011 whereby there is a uh, um, uh, uh, regulators and also the mon uh, acting as the facilitator and also as a monitoring agency on all the developments of renewable energy in Malaysia. I think by having uh, this act in place, it give a, uh, it give a assurance uh, to uh, renewable energy investors and players players on the um, commitment by the government of Malaysia. Uh, to ensure that there is a, a good and proper uh, action plan uh, to be taken up uh, to achieve this renewable energy action plan. I think this is good and uh, we have seen that a lot of countries has also put up a same similar uh, policy. Uh, that means that they are reckoning that uh, there, is a, uh, there is an opportunity uh, in this area uh, and they are inviting uh, a key players, investors uh, to explore the opportunities in the investing in the renewable energy. Uh, so this is uh, something that I think uh, showcase or demonstrate uh, basically the uh, the investment policy of each country. Thanks. Um, of course, um, when we talk about uh, Southeast Asia, we cannot run away uh, with this uh, what what has been targeted by uh, under the concerted efforts by all these uh, countries, and of course under Asian Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation, uh, which Malaysia 
uh, is involved in this uh, particular um, uh, policy. Uh, they have put a specific target that uh, by 2025, the RE share should achieve by 23%. And they will need to also uh, reduce the energy intensity uh, from 20% from uh, 2005. Uh, and uh, to 30% by 2025. So um, what we have to look carefully is that there is a target, a specific target. Uh, it's a commitment by all the countries within Asia that we, they will need to achieve 23% of total primary energy supply and 35% install capacity by 2025. Let's see. What have been achieved uh, so far? Uh, okay, next. And um, if you look at the, what I mentioned just now, APAC, uh, these scenarios, I think um, what it means that the scenario explores that it will take to achieve the regional target for energy intensity and renewable energy outline in APEC between 2016 and 2025 and how they will transform the energy system even beyond 2025. And by doing this is, uh, is to achieve the target of 23%, 23% of total primary energy supply from renewable energy and to reduce the energy intensity by 30% from 2005 levels to 2025. Okay, next. Now, this graph, what we are saying is that if there is um, uh, commitment. If there is a commitment, there is effort that currently be undertaken by individual country on their own to achieve whatever their target and policy target that I mentioned earlier. By 2025, okay, without any extra effort, they are, they will only able to achieve 17.7 percent instead of the 23 percent that we targeted by APAC. And of course, at this point of time, the overall target is only around 13.6%. So, um, okay, um, next, okay. Of course, how to make sure that, you know, uh, from the previous slide just now, the 70%, how to make sure that APEC targets of 20%, 23% is achievable, is that there will be extra effort that need to be undertaken by all these countries. And this is what has been outlined clearly by the APC targets. So that means that all the country need to do a lot more things, okay, uh, including the uh, they need to put a lot more installations. Uh, to, uh, to they need to upscale more RE and EE and EI efforts, and of course they need to apply more technology and potential potential technology enhancements uh, and all those for them to achieve the target of 23%. Next. Okay. Uh, there is a gap, like I mentioned just now, in the event, if there is, in the event, if the country just solely concentrate on their commitment and effort uh, individually, they will only achieve about 70.70% and there is a gap about 5.3%. Uh, to achieve the 23%. Of course, when we talk about numbers, we talk about the value of 5.3% is huge, uh, which I'm going to explain uh, later. All right, next. Okay, um, this is a snapshot of um, what I mentioned just now about the potential within the Asian uh, countries. If you look at the baseline level, uh, the populations uh, is estim the population of the entire uh, Asian countries is going sorry not Asian yeah Asian countries huh? South Asia. Southeast Asia okay the population of Southeast Asia is going to grow from 698 million to 768 million by 2040 okay and of course when we talk about a huge growth in population there will be a lot more demand. There will be a lot more economic activities and of course it will impact hardly on the demand from the uh, the demand of the uh, energy or utilities okay and uh, if you look into the percentage of re in tpes 
okay, uh, the baseline. Uh, if we not doing anything, we are only going to achieve about 14%. But if you go by the policy commitment and the action plan that we put in place by APAC, okay, in 2040, sorry, 2025, we are going to achieve about 23%. And 2040, we are going to achieve about 28.7%. You see, there is a huge jump uh, percentage of renewable energy as compared to the coal, oil, and gas. In fact, we were talking about coal. There is a dip, and we are talk We believe that uh, the renewable energy, sorry, the coal-based uh, power plant is going to dip below 20% in the next two decades. Okay. Next. All right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, of course, um, if you are talking only about the baseline scenario uh, without any extra effort to be undertaken by all these countries, uh, you can see that there will be um, intensity reduction is low and the efficient the efficiency is low. Of course, it will result in the cost, higher cost of energy, and it will be they will require more installation capacity of 700 uh, gigawatt. But of course, when we talk about 700 gigawatt, where it comes from, they will require a lot more installations of a power plant that is a fossil based, especially in terms of coal. Okay, and of course, these are the challenges uh, that uh, that been faced by all these countries. All right. Next. And uh, if you look at the, specifically on the APS renewable energy growth forecast, all right, what we are seeing that there is a huge demand and this is the right timing. Uh, and uh, with the efforts given by the private players, the investors, especially the government, with all those incentives given out to the to the industry the solar capacity is projected to grow by 15 percent okay uh, per year from 2017 levels by 2014 okay there will be a huge growth every year in terms of solar we believe that solar is going to be king of electricity in the market because we see that in many countries solar basically in a very infancy stage Okay, of course, in Malaysia, we have LSS 1, LSS 2, until LSS 4. I don't think we the uh, government is going to stop them uh, to achieve the 20, 25% target. There will be a lot more programs going to be rolled out by the government of Malaysia. Uh, and we see that there is a lot of uh, effort that to increase the level of uh, players in NEM. So there is a lot of effort on solar itself. Of course, uh, wind capacity, we see that is going to grow by 12% per year. Geothermal and biomass uh, will be going to increase by 25% and 10% respectively. All right. Uh, biogas and waste to energy. There's another uh, potential opportunities in all these countries. It will be 20% higher. And of course, uh, when we talk about fossil fuel, it will be deep in fossil fuel. Uh, I think that is uh, something that we committed by uh, by the government and also by the financial institutions and also by the by the players in the sectors. Next, okay. All right. Of course, uh, for K power, what we are interested is more on the demand and what need to be done by the each government, the market itself. And uh, of course, it's all translated into what will be the installed capacity uh, for solar and also for hydro. Okay, so if we're talking about the target by all the respective countries, the collective target by the Asian Pacific, uh, sorry, by Southeast Asia countries from 2020 to 2025, we will see that the solar PV capacity across Asia is going to increase from 32 gigawatt to 83 gigawatt. Okay, there is a huge increase. 
uh, potential increase about 159 percent okay only on the install capacity yeah? and of course uh, for hydropower we believe that okay there is a huge demand also the install capacity is going to grow from is going to grow from 59 gigawatt in 2020 to 77 gigawatt in 2025 there is a huge increase also by 31 percent increase so this is the opportunity in the install capacity which relate back to whatever target that been put in place by each country and collectively by all the countries under the Southeast Asia. Okay, next. Okay, um, of course, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, 2000, 2025 and 2040, uh, we will see there will be a huge expansion, commitment and investment. Okay, taking into consideration the target and commit commitment given by all the countries in achieving the renewable energy target. Okay, uh, hundred we we believe that there will be around 138 gigawatt of new stock capacity until 2025 will be only on the renewable energy and solar and also hydropower will be the main moving factors with regards to the renewable energy program next okay um, in short what we can say here okay when we talk about the target install capacity of course when we talk about the commercial value or the numbers of investment we will see that Okay, um, up until 2025, okay, uh, for them, for any, for the all the countries to achieve the 35% share of RE, the installed capacity will require investment about USD 367 million. So we are talking about 367 million investment to be put within five years period okay and of course uh, what we are seeing that with this huge number okay the re investment by 2025 will be a minimum of usd 281 billion okay or ringgit measure 1.1 trillion within four years or five years period so there is a huge number here and of course this is why we are seeing that uh, renewable energy is uh, something that is growing uh, not only in a short period of time but it's going to be a very significant sector within the energy and utilities industry moving forward even beyond 2025 up until 2014 okay so what we see is that in 2025, there will be a huge investment that is going to be rolled out by all the government. It's within RM1.1 RM trillion. And we believe that beyond 2025, there will be another huge leap in the investment and also the commitment by the government in terms of investment of renewable energy. And of course, K-Power, we are looking into this particular opportunity uh, and of course, when we talk about RM 1.1 trillion in five years, we hope we should be able to achieve some target of uh, some target of couple of uh, one or two billions uh, and another contact every year up until 2025. Okay, uh, this is basically our internal target because we're looking about huge market huge commitment given by the government i think we are in a good positions uh, based on whatever that we have been doing now okay we are in a good position to grab some of this market share within the southeast asia market next okay um of course renewable energy uh, the most important part when we talk about renewable energy is that the ability of renewable energy to replace the fossil fuel energy in terms of costing 
Okay. Uh, and of course, the other benefit is that it's a carbon negative, abandoned and renewable energy supply. It's a clean energy. Okay. No pass through or fuel cost to any utility companies. And of course, the demand is always there. If we're not talking only about the demand, but a commitment. I think that is the most important thing. The policy and commitment by not only South Asian market, but the entire world to make sure that we are in a good, uh, good and clean environment. And of course, energy play a major role in achieving that. So you will see that there will be a lot more innovation, a lot more technology will come out in the near future, not only on the uh, solar, hydropower, wind, biomass, but also we can see there is a lot of research, a lot of investment has been done in the hydrogen fuel cell, okay, to be one of the major uh, player in the renewable energy sectors, okay, and of course, the, like I said, like I mentioned earlier, most important factor is cost effective and consumer demand. We can see both at renewable energy now. There is a consumer demand, there is a growth in demand, there is a commitment government, there is incentive by government, and there is a cost effective when we talk about investment in renewable energy. And of course, there is a growing confidence by the investors itself, and uh, this is something is very positive to the uh, to the industry. Next. Okay, I think uh, that's basically the uh, brief or the uh, presentation about uh, the demand and future of solar uh, and hydro uh, industry. Uh, I hope this uh, gives some highlight on the direction of the industry and the importance of this industry uh, in the market currently and uh, and why K power basically is in this industry basically we are in the uh, we are in line with the uh, growth trajectory of the uh, of this particular industry so um, i'll take this uh, opportunity also to highlight a little bit on this uh, on k power okay next of course um, uh, this is uh, the board of directors uh, i think the board of directors uh, basically is a combination of uh, many players in many industries uh, with wealth experience in variety uh, in various uh, uh, industry and sectors. Next, and of course, uh, K Power is led by a team of a dynamic professional with wealth of experience in project management construction, investment activities, especially in utility and renewable energy sectors. Okay, next. Because um, we, of course, the growth of K-Power always leveraging uh, on the diverse background of its board directors, the experience. Uh, we always leverage on the management vast experience industry network. Uh, and of course, we, like I mentioned earlier, Kepawa is well positioned uh, to secure more projects uh, in Southeast Asia because of our knowledge, our experience and our network. Next. Okay, I think, believe uh, everybody knows about Kepawa and the movement of our share price currently. Next. And uh, here's a snapshot about our history and key milestones. Uh, and of course, this also uh, what we what we're showing is that our milestone, our key milestone, basically, a lot of them are based on the renewable energy, the ability of the company to secure renewable energy projects in Malaysia and also in Southeast Asia. Okay, next. Of course, this is uh, the pillar of our business. We are involved heavily in energy and utilities, especially green and renewable energy. We also have a base in the property development, and we have ventured into logistics and also healthcare and technologies. Next. And uh, this is a snapshot on our corporate structure. Every segment uh, is uh, properly uh, represented by uh, a proper companies. For example, under energy utility, we have K-Power Engineering and K-Power International Limited to take care of all our projects in uh, Southeast Asia. 
uh, outside of Malaysia. Next. Of course, uh, this is uh, our current order book. All right. Uh, like I mentioned, we have established a good platform and network within Southeast Asia, especially in uh, Laos, in Nepal, in Indonesia. Okay, like I mentioned earlier, there is a huge gap between the install capacity and the potential to install. And we are not looking between two or three years. Basically, when we put a platform in the, all these countries, we are looking into a trajectory growth to play and also to participate in their country commitments in achieving their target by the next, by 2040. So this is a, a long-term commitment, a long-term growth, okay? And we believe that uh, we are in the right position to achieve a more and good results to secure more project within this country. And of course, uh, this will not be uh, only countries that we are going to explore. Uh, there will be a lot more opportunities uh, that we we are looking at this point of time. And we hope that uh, with the good timing, a good investment strategy uh, within this Southeast Asian country, uh, a lot more is good result will be coming in our, uh, in our order books. Next. Of course, this is uh, like uh, what we have explained internally. There is our current tender activities. We have doing a lot of bidding exercise, especially in uh, energy and utilities project. Uh, and total bid currently stand at 3.91 billion. And bulk of it basically is from the energy sector. And of course, uh, like I mentioned uh, just now, we are also in the infrastructure, utility, and also on the logistics. Next. Okay, uh, this is some snapshot on our total revenue. Okay, uh, of course, uh, we have achieved a quite significant growth every quarter. Uh, and we hope that uh, this uh, growth will be maintained uh, in the future. And uh, we can meet, uh, even we can achieve uh, beyond the expectation of uh, our internet targets. Next. Okay. And of course, um, uh, I think we have uh, achieved quite a good numbers in terms of profit after tax and PAT margin. Uh, this is a very important to us uh, as a growing company. Uh, we are very selective in terms of uh, taking uh, our project and our EPCC project and uh, EPCC jobs to make sure that we are able to maintain a certain target in term of profit after tax and PAT margin. Okay, uh, this uh, I think we have done quite a good job, and I believe we will be able to do that in the future. Uh, again, uh, next. Okay, uh, of course uh, we talk about uh, increase in revenue, increase in uh, PAT. Of course, uh, the basic earning per share, net asset per share have shown a remarkable and uh, a good result. Uh, for a growing uh, company uh, as per K-Power. And uh, we hope, uh, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, this is something is a very, very uh, important to us to make sure that we maintain the profitability level, uh, profitability level the EPS level, and net asset level. Uh, and uh, I believe that and uh, what we are doing in terms of investment strategy and in terms of our business strategy, we have uh, produced a good result, and uh, this will hope will be continue in the in the future. Next, okay. Um, segmental breakdowns on our activities, of course, uh, bulk of it, I think about ninety percent is coming from the construction related activities, which particularly particularly in the renewable energy. Uh, projects that we have secured. Next. Okay. Well, uh, this basically is a key takeaways from our presentation. All right. Uh, number one, what I'm trying to stress here is that for K Power, uh, shareholders and management have a very strong track record and experience. And uh, we believe that with this strong track record, experience, and networking in Malaysia and outside of Malaysia within Southeast Asia. We believe that there is a lot of opportunity for K-Power. We are leveraging on whatever that we have done, not only for the last couple of years, but 
based on our networking and experience for the last 10 to 20 years. So this is the most important part in KPower and uh, we hope we can leverage more on this to bring more good results to the company. Okay, and uh, we are in a good position to ride the growth of renewable energy market, not only in Malaysia, but to but also in Southeast Asia. We believe that we have put a good platform in all those countries, for example, like Laos, Indonesia, Nepal, and a few more countries that will be coming in a, uh, in a short period of time. So we are in a good platform, uh, a good position to write this, uh, uh, this potential RE programs or RE, in this RE market uh, and also to help uh, to assist the country uh, to achieve whatever target uh, by 2025 and 2040. Okay. And of course, uh, we are steadily progressing the growing path. We have achieved uh, 1.2 billion of the book of works in financial year end 2020. And we are in a good, uh, a good position to achieve our internet target in 2021. Okay. Um, there is a 2 billion order book by financial year end 2021, which of 560 million has been secured. Okay. A lot more to come. Um, of course, we are exploring more corporate uh, exercises. Uh, we will look into more potential merger and acquisition, uh, basically to enhance our business prospect, our business platform in the market. And uh, of course, we we are glad that we have a, a, a good uh, shareholders who are committed to support our computer requirement and expansion of the group. Uh, and we're also glad that, uh, you know, uh, K-Power now is being considered as a very prospective and growing company, not only by the market, but also by financial institution. There's a good support, uh, a good remarks. And uh, basically, what I'm trying to say is here, uh, in a nutshell, K-Power is in the right position to grow further, not only in financial year and 2021, but also beyond up until 2040 because the industry itself is basically it's a growing industry and there's a lot of incentive there's a lot of confidence that we given out by the investors outside there and there is a proper and clear path we're talking about all this program that been put in place not only by malaysia but also by southeast asia countries and also by southeast asian ataupun uh, Asian packs. So with that, um, thank you very much uh, for uh, for we listen to all our presentations. Uh, so uh, I give back to Mr. Chuggy. All right. <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kim. Uh, so uh, <coughs> I think that that's um, the end for a short presentation uh, there. We try to stay away from all the technical parts, uh, and uh, as you can see, there's a lot of potential. Um, so for few billions of order book for K-Power for next five years should not be <laughs> an issue. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Kim? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. And then, uh, of course, we the, the, the key is that um, we have somewhat of a first move advantage where we uh, establish in the South Asia area. Uh, we are already there. And the story of K-Power was uh, when Mustakim, uh, Amiro and myself, we were in the uh, industry back in 2000 uh, during the second generation power plant. Since then, uh, all of us investment bankers, we've been all over the place. Uh, and then our uh, senior VP uh, business development or technical side, Mr. Klam was uh, with General Electric, so he, he was involved in the South Asia country head uh, from Malaysia and South Asia. So um, uh, it doesn't detail the fact that uh, renewable energy, uh, sustainable uh, uh, utilities, uh, huge uh, area for growth. So uh, with that, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, okay, we could uh, we have to give credit. Um, uh, 
there's a lot of uh, you know, sources that we change you know, from uh, World Bank uh, to uh, uh, IRENA uh, to uh, ASEAN uh, Centre for Energy, uh, as well as the ASEAN Secretariat itself. Uh, there are other uh, sources that we uh, we quoted, but we do not publish, um, which is uh, our some of it are our internal uh, study, and we hire a market study from a, a professional. So uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we hand it over to Jeremy. Hi, to our team. Thank you so much for your presentation. So now we open the uh, we open for Q and A's. So right now we have a few questions. So the first one would be by Ilham from M Investment Bank. Is there an overlap in K Power's focus in renewable energy uh, with Serba Dynamics existing businesses? Is there any overlap between K Power and Serba Dynamics? Um, I uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, well, I think there's no overlap. Uh, there's no conflict even. Uh, if you look into the focus of uh, uh, K Power, basically we are looking in. We are basically uh, heavily involved in renewable energy in the EPCC of uh, renewable energy projects. Uh, whilst uh, K, uh, whilst uh, Serba Dynamic uh, is uh, in more on the ONM. Uh, of oil, of oil and gas, uh, that is their focus. Okay, and uh, if you're talking about their construction activities, their construction activities is quite general in nature, uh, and their their expand is uh, beyond renewable energy. And while uh, K Power uh, has been uh, positioned to be a specialized uh, EPCC. Uh, on the renewable energy, and of course, like we mentioned earlier, uh, EPCC uh, at this point of time uh, is our target. And of course, uh, moving forward in the future, we will be uh, involved in the uh, asset ownership program and things like that. I think there's no conflict, there's no overlap with regards to whatever that we have done uh, as compared to uh, Serba Dynamics itself. Thank you. Thank you so much. The second question will be from Puan Hamida from EPF. What are the major challenges for Malaysia to achieve the target capacity by 2025? Until now, we are still lagging behind regional peers. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think there are a few factors. Um, number one, um, of course, uh, the government of Malaysia has, uh, has been promoting this industry. Uh, since a long time, all right, uh, and of course, uh, they aggressively putting in a lot of uh, incentive from the government's point of view, uh, a lot of incentive, a lot of program. In fact, they come out with a GTFS and things like that. But then again, uh, uh, when we talk about doing uh, investment uh, in the renewable energy uh, projects, um, there are a lot more to that. Uh, basically, we are the support will not only come will will not only come from the government but we need also need a support from the financial institutions and also from the private equity investors uh, and also the understanding of the importance of this renewable energy project to the environments not only to the federal government but also to the state government i see uh, these are all the factors that play uh, that need to come together to ensure that the implementation of the renewable energy project can be done at a smooth level and can be executed uh, completely. We have a lot of experience undertaking renewable energy project in various states in Malaysia. And of course, when we talk about various state, the state is the one who control the water, the land, okay, and they have a various regulations with regards to that. So when there is uh, uh, what we are seeing is that what we need is basically a facilitator uh, or an agency to ensure that the approvals and the regulation is being met not only at the federal level 
but also at the agent uh, at the state level this is very important okay um, the implementation of renewable energy project in every in all the states need to be uh, to be smoothened out okay now that's number one second is that the like i mentioned earlier uh, the financial institution need to be more aggressive okay no need to be fair that they have they should look at this renewable energy program as a growing uh, growing and uh, growing investment okay a growing prospect so they need to be more flexible in a certain things all right and of course this need to be uh, coming in in tandem with the government incentive so if we have all this in place uh, i believe there will be a lot more people coming in to do investment in the renewable energy projects okay and of course this will help to achieve a certain target by government of malaysia all right so when we talk about uh, renewable energy like i mentioned in malaysia the most famous one is solar hydro biomass biogas and things like that of course we have a very limited uh, wind project when we talk about solar of course we require a huge acres of land and all this land basically either private or the state governments so again we are coming to the regulatory regime on how to apply how to utilize all this and uh, of course it falls under the state regulatory approvals we talk about uh, hydro of course we are utilizing the water and again when we talk about utilizing the water it come under a certain regime with certain regulatory approvals under the state governments and the federal and the state need to uh, to see that this is something that can help the government in term of not only achieving a certain target but also as economic stimulus okay uh, to the industry uh, to achieving a certain target uh, and to help uh, the players uh, in the market so uh, these are a few factors that i believe uh, come into my mind based on our experience handling initiating and executing the projects so uh, if we really want to achieve the targets in malaysia i think there's a lot of things that need to be done uh, at the federal institutions financial institution and also at the state levels thank you thanks mr kim a third question would be there are hiccups like covid 19 crisis hasn't peaked yet with lockdowns and uh, with all these limitations and labor issues how can k how can k power reduce the potential impact on project delays of course um uh, yes we understand that um, uh, we have gone through MCO one, we have gone through MCO two, lockdown, COVID is still there. But again, uh, when we, uh, when they, when the government come out with the regulations uh, with regards to this MCO and restriction of undertaking certain economic activities, um, energy and utilities is always something that can be considered by the government as essentials okay uh, they, they do not see uh, the construction of mini hydro projects or solar as purely or merely construction activities but it relates to the energy and utilities is something that is essential to the uh to the government of malaysia and this also be supported by seda by the suruhanjaya tenaga and of course with that uh it still give us a room for us to do the construction to undertake the activities with a certain limitation of course and uh when we talk about uh, mini hydro projects all our project basically are in a very remote area uh in the jungle in a mountainous area and of course, uh, we are away from uh, from uh, from the so-called from uh, community. Uh, okay, that's another uh, room that we have actually explained to the uh, regulators, uh, to the state government, that we are able to undertake our projects without uh, without worrying about this MCO and MCO one. Of course, they have given us some leeway. Uh, some freedom to undertake our activities so that's why uh, like I, I mentioned earlier in our presentation 
um, of course we are in a good industry even at the MCO at the COVID time uh, because of the essential and also the commitment by the government to see that all these projects can be executed uh, and uh, can be uh, can be executed and can become uh, can be operated uh, in a normal way. Thank you. Mm, there's another question on. Can you share with us the progress of your projects? Are there any complications that you are facing? Okay. Um, of course, uh, we have a couple of projects uh, in Malaysia and uh, also in Southeast Asia. And uh, like I mentioned, in Malaysia, uh, we are, I would say, uh, there are projects uh, that been uh, that a little bit slow down because of the MCO, but we are progressing. Uh, none of our project uh, actually stop. Okay. And uh, that is a good thing for us. Uh, but we talk about our project in Laos. The project in Laos is progressing as uh, as what we expected, okay, uh, as per our timeline. Because over there, uh, basically, there's no lockdown. Uh, all the project continue as uh, uh, continue as what uh, been promised by the governments. And of course, same goes to Nepal. Our project in Nepal uh, proceed as it is, uh, achieving. Uh, a progress like what we have expected. Uh, there is no lockdown over there, uh, especially on the, all the essential project, uh, including ours. Uh, and of course, uh, also in Indonesia, the progress is uh, as per what we expected. Okay, uh, there is a restriction in terms of movement, but there's no lockdown in Indonesia, business as usual. Um, and uh, we believe that uh, with this uh, condition and situation, uh, it gives us a balance, lah. You know, uh, while we have some limitation in Malaysia, but luckily uh, all our project outside of Malaysia is progressing quite well, uh, as per our uh, timeline deadline uh, that we have committed to all our clients. Thank you. All right, I have another question. Um, what are your thoughts on the downtrend, downward trending cost of EPCC and whether it will impact profitability of future projects? Of course, um, um, okay, when we talk about EPCC contract, uh, obviously um, it's not a main contract. That number one, we have to understand when we talk about EPCC contract, there is a lot of element inside the EPC contracts. Uh, there is a design design elements, there is a engineering, procurement, construction, installation, and commissioning. And uh, we can't generalize the uh, profitability of EPCC uh, based on one figure because every uh, every packages have their own uh specific margin for example like design when we do a design it can give a good and uh, handsome uh, profitability or profit margin at that point of times uh, we go to the construction maybe it lower a bit when we go to the installation and commissioning it give us a better levels and we do a procurement on our own uh, we uh, definitely we uh, reduce some cost over there and we increase certain profitability. So uh, in a in a short, what I'm trying to say is that it based on your creativity, based on your system, based on your application and also strategy, business strategy. OK, that is how you ensure. Where can you sustain your profitability levels? All right. And uh, so there is no such thing as a increase and decrease in EPCC profitability. Uh, uh, I think uh, when we talk about uh, profitability levels to all the contractors, yes, they were, because they were talking about materials, they were talking about uh, construction, they were talking about resources. But we're talking about EPCC, there's more towards that. So we are not worried about uh, profitability levels because all the way, I think we managed to get 
whatever numbers that we are targeting. And uh, we foresee that in the future, we are able to apply the same strategy. And with the application of good technology, uh, good system, I think that will give us, uh, that leverage us into a better positions, especially on the project outside of Malaysia. Thank you. Will K Power embark in asset ownership? And if yes, what is the timeline? Um, yes, um, like we have explained to uh, many uh, market to analysis to analysts uh, to the investors. Um, yes, we are embarking into uh, into asset ownership. Uh, we have been we are bidding uh, we are bidding the LSS four. Okay, and in the event if we able to win the bidding exercise, of course that will be the first asset ownership program under K Power, and of course we are aggressively looking aggressively looking into NEM net energy metering. We are obviously looking uh, aggressively into a solar program in Malaysia and also outside of Malaysia. And uh, and uh, all these uh, are the uh, are the programs and also are the uh, strategy that we have put in place. And uh, I think uh, the timeline, uh, like I said, the, the 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 nearest timeline is that when we win the LSS four, we are going to be the first ownership program uh, for uh, K Power. Uh, we hope that the result can be announced as early as possible. We are eagerly waiting for that. <laughs> and uh, again, um, uh, that doesn't discount the fact that we are looking also in other areas, for example, like uh, mini hydro, biomass, and also on the uh, net energy monitoring solar programs. Thank you. Mm, I think I have a last question here. As a All percentile right. of contract value, what is the amount of working capital needed on average to execute these projects? So let's say if your contract value is one million, so in in, in terms of uh, costing, right? Uh, what kind of working in, in terms of working capital? What what is the amount of working capital needed on average? Uh, yeah, uh, I can answer that. Sure. <laughs> thank you, bro. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think um. Thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned during the select presentation, uh, typically for contract value of uh, one million, uh, you need around thirty percent uh, working capital uh, to support the project. Yeah, uh, it's not maximum thirty percent all the time, uh, but it goes up and down uh, because you get payment on a progress basis. Um, so uh, there's gap of say, for example, two to three months. Uh, uh, say okay, sorry. Let me go back a bit. You usually submit your claim, say a uh, hundred thousand. Uh, then you go to the bank. Uh, get in drawn down. Um, uh, and then uh, two to three, two three months after that, you get paid. Uh, so they uh, the bank will take that hundred thousand to pay themselves back. Um, uh, that this one uh goes on uh throughout the uh contact period. Uh, and uh, maximum you require based on S curve uh, usually is up to 30% of the project value. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the floor? Hey, hi, uh, Patrick here from uh, Midcorp. Can I just ask a question to you guys? Um, I mean, thank you for the uh, presentation. It's uh, very interesting. Um, just want to check uh, on your LSS poll. I uh, understand the market that the bid rate is uh, pretty low, about 17 to 23 cents. How are you guys? Uh, um, 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 can can money be made from this kind of pricing? May I know? Ah, <laughs> uh, thank you for the <laughs> for the question. <laughs> I'm not yes. sure whether I can answer that. <laughs> what kind of, what of kind course, of you know, uh, of course, when um, uh, I think uh, when uh, all the candidates they put the bidding exercise, I'm sure they have uh, basically done their their models. Yeah, uh, I'm sure they have taken into consideration uh, the pricing of the PV, uh, the construction pricing. And uh, obviously, they have also made some assumption 
in term of the financial cost. Uh, and uh, I think all the uh, so-called the potential bidders, uh, they they have come into uh, understanding that when you when we do when you go for the bidding uh, for LSS four, uh, there is. Uh, you have to accept a certain level of IRR or return on the projects. It, it will not be, uh, it will not be that high or it will not be that low. Okay, uh, but I think uh, for I would I would just say about K Power. I don't want to talk about other peoples. Okay, for K Power, of course, we have put certain uh, checklists here. When we put the LSS four bidding exercise. We know where is our strength and where is our weaknesses. Uh, we know how to play this game. We know how to structure our financing, especially, and that is where it gives us a certain leverage in terms of uh, uh, return and uh, uh, and also in terms of financial cost. And uh, I think, um, regardless of what we are doing, I think other people are also doing the same thing. Uh, but uh, we see how. Uh, but uh, in a nutshell, what we are seeing is that. Uh, to those people who are playing with LSS form, they basically knows that uh, they have a certain lower, uh, not to say lower, but uh, so-called manageable return that uh, can be expected from this exercise. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, right. Very good answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, just, just to add up, uh, just to refer back to the uh, uh, presentation, uh, as, as Mustaki mentioned, uh, it, it, a lot of variables. Uh, also, the location of your of your farm, uh, solar farm, uh, is critical. As you see from the presentation, those with uh, higher uh, capacity uh, efficiency have uh, better chances. Uh, during the LLS3, it was like 14 cent, the lowest cent. So, when LLS3 uh, first in was last 2019, eh, Amira. Yeah. Uh, 2019, we were shocked. It was 14 cent. Uh, then we, we uh, as Mustaki mentioned, uh, 17 cent. And LS4, it goes down even lower. Um, so we have to do proper study uh, in terms of bidding, lah, of course. Uh, we have to do proper study and look at the uh, location, uh, look at the how we can tap the, uh, the grid. And <coughs> of course, the like, what uh, Amiru uh, presented just now, they have to be creative in terms of the financing and also to get the uh, financial engineering to get your required ROE. So uh, that's, I think it will be competitive. Uh, open bidding is always that way. Uh, similar to any other mode of renewables, uh, even in hydro, you have to, to have the right scale and the right location to do it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck in your LSS. Thanks. Okay. Uh, final question, question. Uh, from James. What is the equity IRR that K Power is looking at for asset ownership? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I think um, um, we are looking at uh, 10%, if I can say that, um, 10 to 12%. Uh, depending on the uh, locality of uh, the project, uh, uh, usually uh, reward is associated with risk. The higher risk that you're taking, you usually will want uh, higher uh, return. Lah. Uh, just put it uh, simply, that's a theory of uh, finance. Um, uh, I think that's all. I think 10 to 12% is the answer. Unless Mustaki wants to say a few things because he seems to say he wants to add a few more things. <laughs> No, nah, no, nah, I'm, uh, I'm okay with that uh, because I think uh, when we look into the project, when we look into the asset ownership, uh, every project have a, have a unique uh, characteristics, especially when we talk about the locality like what uh, Amiru mentioned. Uh, when we talk about uh, Indonesia, obviously I'm looking at higher uh, equity returns in Indonesia as compared to Malaysia. And we talk about Laos, Nepal and things like that. And of course, that's why um, uh, what we are positioning ourselves is that we go in as an EPC contractor first because we want to have a proper uh, and a proper understanding of undertaking projects uh, in uh, in various countries. Uh, 
okay uh, and that's why um, you know uh, we are looking into becoming an NPCC to understand the uh, the project to understand the so called the regulatory framework of that particular uh, particular countries and uh, from there we are embarking into uh, the asset ownership uh, of course uh, we are talking about uh, financial theory we of course we are looking at double digit uh, equity returns uh, but again the equity return always uh, have to look into more things not only just equity return but also on the debt the structure the risk and uh, a lot more things uh, that's all <laughs> thank you very much All right, thank you so much uh, everyone for joining the presentation. Thank you so much K-Power team. Thank you so much Mustaqim, uh, Amira Afif, and also Shukri uh, for, for your time and uh, dedication. So with this, I think uh, we, we wrap up this presentation and uh, see you again next time. Thank, right. you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.